Hey, Nikki Sanders here with Nikki Sanders Leadership Consulting. Welcome to another video on the More Than Social Work with Nikki Sanders YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in and for subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed already, please do, because we will talk about a lot here, including social work, but lots of other things that are interconnected to social work, which really is life in general. So today is a life in general kind of social work day. So as I am here, um, I generally go on my walk first and then make the videos after because it allows me to be more connected, be more prepared and really feel like my authentic self with a clearer mind. And although you can still hear a little bit of traffic or at least I can still hear a little bit of traffic, it is vastly different from my life growing up. I grew up in the city, Washington DC to be exact. So the city that is the heart of the United States politics and government. And I've worked in every quadrant of the city as well. But today, um, as I was getting dressed, I saw breaking news that a child in a DC public school was shot. So what they said is child, they named the school, uh, shot. That's very different, truthfully. When we think about media, that's very different than what actually happened. Now, I understand that there is a race to be first. That's a whole nother issue we don't have to address today. But there's a race to be first in the media. And they were reporting without having, right, like all of the facts, which sent everybody into a panic and a frenzy. Now, I am not going to downplay the situation because it absolutely was a situation that was crucial, that was important, that was traumatic, heartbreaking, made me sad, made me angry all at the same time. The young lady was in class, so no one brought a gun into the school. The young lady was in class, there was something happening outside, and bullets came into the building. She was grazed by one of the bullets. So that's vastly different than what I thought when I heard the first news story. Still terrible and tragic, but vastly different than what I thought initially. But I want to talk about that from a social work perspective and in relation to the work that I've done and my own upbringing. Like I grew up in Washington, D.C. at the height of the crack epidemic when Washington, D.C. was the murder capital of the United States. And the crime that we are seeing right now with young people, um, the guns, the fighting, the robbery, the carjackings, those things are very reminiscent of 30, 35 years ago. So um, that's extremely disheartening. Um, and again, it makes me sad and angry at the same time. But when I worked with um, a particular program, I was, uh, our programs were run in Washington, D.C. public school and in a suburb of Washington, D.C. And the students' lives were vastly different. And so when we would bring those two sets of young people together, the things that they were afraid of and had issues uh, with were very different, even though in general, teen life is the same. But there were stark differences in growing up, you know, 30 minutes away from each other. And so our suburban young people um, were very concerned about school shooting, someone bringing a gun into the school, which in their school system has happened quite a few times, even this school year, but no one was hurt. In Washington, D.C., our young people were concerned about what would happen on their way to school because they had to go through metal detectors. So they weren't overly concerned. They were scared, but they weren't overly concerned with school shootings in the same way that we've seen mass school shootings um, all over the country because there were um, security and metal detectors. And so let's just talk about that. When we think about young people and institutionalizing children, and that is always gonna be my stance, that we are institutionalizing children. Reasons aside, it's what's happening. So I am not a fan of uniforms. I'm gonna say that I never have been. There are people who say that children act better when they're wearing uniforms or that it gives young people um, less things to tease each other about or you don't have to worry about the best Jordan 
That's actually not true. It's not true. Um, as someone who went to a Catholic school for one year, I hated my uniform in seventh grade. Um, but even as an adult, as a parent, um, I know as someone who worked in the school, kids will tease each other about anything. So you all can have on the same uniform, but are your shoes going to cost more than theirs? Does your purse cost more? Do you not have a haircut? Is your hair done better? Do you have on extensive earrings? Where did you get your backpack? There are things, you know, your size, your weight, your shape, your family structure, your house, your car. There are so many things that children will find something to tease each other about. And I get it when people say like, well, that's one less thing, but it actually isn't because we can tell the difference and children definitely can tell the difference in a uniform that came from like a discount store versus maybe a uniform that they got in Macy's. Not that Macy's is super high end, but you know what I mean, right? Um, and so what that does for me is it tells children, this is what you're supposed to look like um, in this space. To me, it cuts out their freedom of expression and does not allow them to express themselves. Now, of course, you can have um, dress codes that are equal for male and female. You can have dress codes um, that you know prohibit um, very risque attire, but you can still allow young people to express themselves in terms of who they are um, as people. Um, the second part of that is in these schools, depending on the grade a young person was in, whether it was middle school or high school, they had a different color shirt based on their grade. So again, they could be identified based on their shirt and what grade that they were in. Like prisoners, I don't care what anyone says. When young people show up at school after getting out of bed, maybe sleeping well, maybe not sleeping well, depending on what happened in their home or in their community or their neighborhood, how easy was their trek to school? Was it train? Was it bus? Was it walking past shady grown folks? Was it, you know, walking through neighborhoods where there was beef? Was it hoping that you don't get jumped by someone else? So getting to school for many young people can be a challenge. And then once they get to school, they have to stand in line and go through a metal detector. The metal detectors are invasive. If, if you've gone through uh, a metal detector in a court building, or in an airport, you know that it takes a long time and you know that it can feel invasive, right? And so if we are starting eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds with these uniforms, with these metal detectors, with being searched, because they don't just walk through the metal detectors, they have to take their bags off. Do you have something in your water bottle? Oh, it went off, all of those things. I'm gonna tell you this, I went through a metal detector at a specific school, it went off. Uh, and it's foolish to me, right? So I was like, right when the metal detector went off and the security personnel came over to me and said, do you have on the underwire, bro? Now, normally that would be a personal question, but I laughed because that's what set the metal detector off. But had it been a male or had it been a person who was less empathetic, it could have been a whole situation early in the morning and I'm just trying to go into the school to do the thing that I want to do. And those are the things that happen to children. In some of these schools, they also have to turn in their cell phones. So after they go to the metal detector, they go to another area and they turn in their cell phones and they can't have cell phones to the end of the day. Now, I'm not saying that that's not a problem because we need kids to be learning. Um, I don't want to see kids recording fights and all the things. But we also know that young people use their phones for help, support, and assistance. And a lot of things would not get addressed if young people did not have their cell phones. So we are taking away their freedom of expression. We're telling them to dress. When you think about it, if you go into a prison, you can identify who that person is by the numbers on their clothes. In DC, we used to be like, oh, he got on the orange jumpsuit. He just got out of DC jail, right? So you can see children that way. Now, everyone doesn't think about it the way I think about it. And that's okay. It's not going to change my mind. It's totally okay. But my point is that we have to really, especially social workers, 
take, um, maybe responsibility isn't the right word. I think we have to get engaged in a different way, change the conversation, ask different questions when it comes to how we want to support, protect and educate children. Because that, are they really being educated well if they are afraid? They aren't. Are they being educated well if their teachers are afraid, their teachers are burned out, if the people around them um, have unaddressed issues, adults or children, if they're hungry, right? If they are being bullied, right? All of those things as social workers, we need to take into account. So for me to be able to sit outside regularly and work, to walk outside very regularly, to listen to the sounds of nature, not gunshots, because there was a time in my life when I heard gunshots regularly. There was a time in just like that gun, that bullet went through um, the window at the school. We had bullets that came through our front door. And I can't deny those things. So I understood those young people's issues from a different space and <clears throat> getting them both to understand each other um, when they were together and say, well, this group is worried about mass shooting. Someone coming into the school, this person is worried about are they going to make it to school or are they going to make it home from school? But we needed to hear both of them. So empathy is important. And I'm not going to go into a lot of research, but there's research that says for young people who live in violent communities, um, many low income inner cities, that their PTSD can be equal to those people who live in war zones. And we don't address those young people that way. We look at them as part of the problem. Now, I'm not saying this as a clinician. I'm not a therapist. I'm not diagnosing anyone. What I'm saying is, as intelligent human beings and educated professionals, we know that person and environment and that, those young people's environment impacts who they are, how they thrive. Are they just in survival mode? What do we want from them if they are just in survival mode? Because we know Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if those young people's basic needs aren't met, we can't expect them to do the things that we want them to do. Now, I'm not ex you know, excusing behavior. I'm not saying that there aren't things that we can do. I'm saying we have to address young people differently. Um, and so I was gonna talk about teens from a different point of view um, today <laughs> because uh, one of my current colleagues asked me, what is it that I love about working with young people? And at first I paused because I was like, hmm, what is it, right? I'm a natural born teacher. Um, a, a natural born supporter, educator, really kind of motherly, right? And, but I really settled on, there are a lot of things that I learned by trial and error. And it took me a lot more time to achieve the things that I wanted to achieve. And so if I can help someone cut out some of the same mistakes that I made, sometimes we have to make our own mistakes. You know, they can make their own, find their own way. But if I can help someone avoid some of the challenges, the mistakes, the pitfalls that I made and give them the information that I know that they are missing, then I absolutely will do that. And for young people, I want to be able to be that resource when so many people are looking at them as bad and out of control and doesn't want to work with teenagers, um, connecting with them in a different way and being able to be that support and that resource is important to me. Same thing for college students. As a first-generation college student, I figured out a lot of things on my own. And as someone who's been working with youth for over two decades, someone who has been in the classroom as a professor and been a, um, an internship consultant for nursing students, psychology students, sociology students, human relations students, social work students, public health students for over a decade, um, I see the gaps. I see the gaps in the kids who had a strong family background, who did well in school and somebody cheered them on, whose parents were um, college graduates and knew what to do or knew, had connections for them to make, for young people who have never been in a professional environment, their parents aren't in a professional environment, so they don't know what to do. 
And so for me, it's combining education and those workforce development and life skills that is really important to me. So even as a professor in the classroom, I'm giving those life skills and those professional development skills along with the education that I'm teaching. So what is the purpose of me saying all of this to you today? I want to remind you all that young people need us. They need us to step up. They need us to hear them, to see them. They need us to understand. And if we don't understand initially, give them the opportunity to express and explain themselves that young people need mentors, resources, support systems, and we can do that. That young people are struggling with things that we never had to struggle with growing up. If you are over 30, over 40, there are things that these young people are dealing with just with social media by itself um, that we didn't have to deal with when we were growing up. If someone was bullying you, it stopped when you were out of their presence. Now it doesn't stop. It's on social media, it's online for hours and hours. These young people are bombarded with fear and crime and violence. You know, when I was a teenager, the thing that I was worried about walking um, to school, especially if I was walking to school by myself, is was some stranger gonna come kidnap me? Not human trafficking, because that even was that wasn't even in my brain. But was somebody going to kidnap me? Was somebody going to rape me? You know, those kinds of things. Not downplaying it, but I didn't live my life in constant fear. Now, I did live in fear of dirty old men. I mean, I lie. Um, so, um, you know, think about that, right? Think about that. I've talked with young people, girls in particular, where these two young ladies, they were relatives, same grade, walked to school together every day. One of them got sick. And the other one came to school and she waited all day until I got there at lunch hour to say, you know, Miss Nikki, I'm scared to walk home by myself. I'm like, well, what's going on? And I thought it was, you know, a fight or something. And she said, well, when I was walking to school, this old man on the porch said, oh, where your friend at? You walking to school by yourself today. And she had never noticed that this man was watching them out the window. Now he could have been an old man who was just looking out for the kids in the neighborhood. But to her, it was shady. It was a dirty old man. And so what I had her do was reach out to her mom and see if, the, if she could find somebody else to walk home with so that she could feel safe. So as a teenage girl, I fully understood what she meant by that. But it, it's time for us to address our young people in a different way. Um, I'm not excusing any behavior, but I'm saying we raised them or not. And it's time for us to take a different level of accountability if we want to change the trajectory of these children's lives. That's all I got. That, that sounded more like a lecture and I am so sorry because um, I am not here to lecture. I know that sounded more like a lecture, but I do want to encourage you to reach out to the young people in your life, in your family, in your community, in your neighborhood, at your place of employment, and give your expertise as a social worker. So there may be things that people aren't thinking about that you as a social worker can look at it from a different perspective and change the conversation, ask those questions, speak up. When I talked about young people, I'd be like, okay, our babies. They'd be like, babies? Yes, because they're my babies, because they're babies, right? They're babies. How you address children matters because they know what you think about them. So I am a safe space because they understand that I love and care about them. Their parents understand that I love and care about them. Now I set boundaries. <laughs> um, I definitely set boundaries, but in love because I want them to succeed. I want no child to live down to low expectations and young people will live down to your low expectations. There's a group of people that you tell them they can't do something and they're like, bet, I can do it. And there's another group that, that sinks into their soul and, and weighs them down for a really long time and they have to dig themselves out of that. So I'm gonna challenge you as a professional to change the conversation when we're talking about young people and speak up for them because they really do need someone to speak up for them, but they also need someone to show them how to speak up for themselves. And so I saw on Facebook um, today, one of my memories said, um, I want to meet young people where they are 
and help them get to where they want to go. So if you know me, and definitely if you know me professionally, you know I, that is a pet peeve. They're like, oh, we need to meet young people where they are. Yes, we do. But we are not leaving them there. So what are you doing to get them to their next level, their next chapter? Because keeping it real is not working. We need to do something different. No judgment, love, boundaries, and resources and support. That's what these young people need. And so as social workers, I'm going to challenge all of us to do it, whether we're social workers in the school system or we are social workers in juvenile justice or foster care, whatever it is, there is a young person that needs you to speak up for them. There's probably a whole group of young people that needs you to speak up for them. So this is Nikki Sanders with Nikki Sanders Leadership Consulting. Thanks for listening to this video. I would love to hear your thoughts um, just about young people and what we do to support them. What are you seeing in your role uh, as a professional and what do you think we need to do to change the trajectory of things that are happening in the world right now? And shout out to the young people who are protesting on college campuses. Let me say that too. Um, that's a whole nother video. But shout out to those young people who are advocating, standing up, protesting for what they believe in peacefully, with intention, with purpose. They know what they want and why they want it. And they are not backing down. So shout out to those young people as well. All right. See you soon for the next video. This is Nikki Sanders with Nikki Sanders Leadership Consulting. Thanks for watching. Share with a friend. And I'm going to hang up now because I'll start a whole other conversation. All right. We'll save that for the next video. Bye.